Welcome everyone again. My name is Oscar Ramirez. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Startup Commons. Uh, let me start today by borrowing an ecosystem definition by the uh, Kaufman Foundation. That it says, uh, an ecosystem that allows for the fast flow of talent, information and resources, helps entrepreneurs quickly find what they need at each stage of growth. And as a result, the whole is greater than the sum of its separate parts. It is, I would say, definitely a, a great way to communicate the, the, the essence of an ecosystem, isn't it? Uh, one of the first thoughts that comes to, to, to mind based on that definition is that the more and better talent an ecosystem has with permanent access to information and resources in a manner equally available to all parties involved in the ecosystem, the better for everyone, right? So therefore, uh, it is important to, to, to have uh, ecosystem builders that um, start looking at ecosystems in such a way to unlock the full potential of each of the individuals and organizations within the ecosystem. So no one can be left behind. I mean, uh, talent, uh, doesn't understand anything about gender or race. It is also very important to make supporting services and resources fully available, combining in-person and online formats to reach every corner of the ecosystem. And data and information must be shared and data must be flow to enable interoperability. So there must be uh, a clear intention and, and a strategy uh, that takes these governing principles into account to maximize the potential of the whole ecosystem. But at the same time, uh, it is extremely important to come up with new measurements that allow us to, to understand and assess an ecosystem from those dimensions in order to, to improve, because it is impossible to develop what we do not understand or we don't uh, measure. And that's why we have today with us Forward Cities, uh, a US-based nonprofit uh, with a mission to equip community leaders with uh, strategies and tools uh, to create more equitable opportunities for entrepreneurs. And today to present us uh, what is needed to understand the elements of a healthy, inclusive entrepreneurship ecosystem, how to assess the, the current health and equity of a local ecosystem, how to prioritize goals and how to co-design solutions. So let me introduce very briefly our guest speakers today from Forward Cities. So first of all, we have uh, Faye Horwitz. She's uh, the, the president of Forward Cities and she oversees organizational strategy and serves as the executive lead of the eShip Communities Initiative. We also have uh, Brett Brenton, who is the senior director of Learning Networks. So uh, Brett coordinates uh, the eShip communities engagements and also helps to ensure that the practices of forward cities and related partners are properly disseminated to people committed to advancing the craft of building equitable entrepreneurial ecosystems. And last but not least, uh, we have Garrett Raksek, who is the senior manager of special projects at forward cities. Uh, he is particularly focusing on, on moving organizations beyond data analysis and towards uh, a more inten intentional use of findings. So Faye, Brett, Garrett, welcome to the webinar. It is a real pleasure to have you here today with us. Thank you, Oscar. It's fantastic to be here. Uh, and I sure, I'm sure I speak for both uh, Brett and Garrett when I say we're very grateful for the opportunity to, to be able to share today. Um, this is uh, a special group of folks from, from around the world, and we're uh, thankful for your time. We know uh, that we are living in some very um, unique times. We know that there's a lot of challenges facing um, many cities and countries around the world. Uh, race, uh, issues of race and gender equity, uh, issues now of, of health in staggering ways that we ne never would have imagined uh, just a couple of years ago. And this is, this is a heavy, can be a very heavy time, but I will say that one of the things that, that we've witnessed at Forward Cities uh, in our work is that it's also uh, a hopeful time. 
there is work being done by many people like you around the, around the world uh, to really make a difference in people's lives related to um, how, do, how do you uh, lean into entrepreneurship as a means for opportunity and equity. And, and that is the, what Forward Cities leans into uh, for our mission. And grateful to be here today to share uh, how we view this work and our perspective and uh, how we are working with communities uh, like, like the ones that you, where you live to be able to, to do this work. So uh, just from a, from a, a, a mission-based standpoint, um, Forward Cities, was, we were uh, launched in 2014. Uh, our mission is to equip community leaders like you with strategies and tools to grow and sustain equitable investment in entrepreneurs and the support networks they need to thrive. And when we say investment, we mean, don't just mean money, we mean uh, resources, time, uh, yes, uh, financial capital, but also social capital and you know, a, a relational capital. How can everyone in a community lean into supporting uh, entrepreneurship in an equitable way? And so our work is uh, around, the, around the country at this point, uh, around the US. We have uh, worked in over 30 uh, communities around the country. Uh, we're now in uh, 10 plus. And uh, as a part of our work, we, uh, we have engagements of different lengths. We work also, uh, we have a phenomenal partnership with the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation. Uh, and they have engaged us over the past uh, few years uh, and into the 2022, to really be able to, to put some, uh, some tangibility and to codify the field of ecosystem building, particularly for folks, uh, how can we ensure that there are zero barriers to anyone that wants to participate? And in, as a part of that work, we're working in four communities, Baltimore, Long Beach, um, we're also working in um, uh, Kansas City, and a region in central New Mexico. We are very grateful to have some other, other fantastic partners um, that we do this work with. We, we could not do this work alone. We work in tandem in local communities with ecosystem builders like you, uh, entrepreneurial support organizations, corporate partners, uh, foundations. Uh, it takes a village in many ways to do this work and we're grateful for the partners across the Forward Cities Network. For Forward Cities as a team, one of the things that we do um, is lean into a holistic approach for communities. And so uh, we do this work in five key areas. Uh, we help communities understand their work and assess their ecosystems through research and evaluation, which is extremely important. As Oscar said, you cannot change what you don't understand. So being able to assess it is, is crucial. Uh, and then there's a piece of what do you do with that information? Uh, you can't, data is not there for the sake of data. You actually have to um, engage with it. You have to chew on it and you have to bring people together. And our community innovation and engagement um, work is based on bringing people together to, to sense make and to make decisions around uh, the data about their ecosystem. And then it's also important if you're trying to reach as many people as possible and get that work um, move that work beyond just a core small group of folks. You have to lean into storytelling. You have to be able to uh, uh, share how the work is emerging. And so marketing communications is a, is a huge part of our work as well. And as Brett uh, is here on the, on the call, he is, uh, as Oscar said, our senior director of learning networks. And we have that role in that set of work because it, we cannot contain this knowledge Right, the way to scale equity in any in any community means that you have to share what you're learning. As we engage in this work, and we as we engage communities in this work, we encourage them to talk with one another to share their learnings and to share across communities. And then uh, what we do also is we we know that this work cannot be done without funding um, and without resources. And so we help communities try and understand how they can uh, identify the sources of, of uh, sustainable funding for this work and to make sure they have they're equipped to do this. And all of this work is not forward cities doing work as a consultant, but as a capacity builder. And our vision really is with all of the work that we do, um, ideally we have this beautiful vision of equity for every entrepreneur, which we call E3. And that is that hope that, um, that every entrepreneur will have equitable opportunity and access to launch, grow and sustain a business that grows wealth for themselves, 
uh, their families and or their communities. And we believe that this, in many ways, this is a right. Victor Wong talks about uh, the right to start and we truly believe that. And as a part of that work, um, what we think about is uh, we bring it back to how do you, um, how do you know what equity is? How do you measure these things? How do you, uh, how do you think about the values that you wanna lean into? Uh, when you're attempting to make a more healthy and equitable ecosystem. So one of the things we like to think about is this idea of what if every entrepreneur um, had had essentially a bill of rights, right? What are the things that we would we would want them to be able to lead into? And it's not, uh, diversity and inclusion is not enough. What we found is that, th that those things happen often by accident or they happen just through words. And so we've added a couple of elements and values that we believe are crucial and that we see specifically are important for entrepreneurs. And these are more actionable. Um, and so uh, we have developed a, an anti-racism framework specifically for people who work in uh, entrepreneurial ecosystems. And that is called ABIDE. Uh, and that acronym stands for Access, Belonging, Inclusion, Diversity, and Equity. And those other two, those first two that we often don't hear, may not have heard in this context before of DEI work, um, are crucial because one of the things we see is that it's not enough for resources to exist uh, in an ecosystem. If everyone is not able to equitably access them, uh, say for reasons of transportation or disability or abil level of ability or uh, geographic location or language um, or, or the ability to pay money for programs, then it is not accessible. And that means that it is not equitable. Uh, the second area that we lean into that's really important is this idea of belonging. That inclusion is really about still putting the power in the hands of, of the people who are, um, who are in the majority to say, we are including you and it puts it in their lane. This idea of belonging takes it out of that realm and, and creates a space where everyone should have the right to be in spaces, to engage with people in their ecosystem and with programming where they feel like they belong. Not, like, not just that they've been included, but that everything that is done actually factors them in from the beginning. Everything that is built, created, and programmed has their them in mind, and it's not just an add-on. So that piece piece of, about belonging is extremely important. And then, of course, um, we've added in over the past year had to consider uh, COVID nineteen and the impacts of COVID nineteen, and and that's because all of these equity issues that we're talking about were have been exacerbated and made worse uh, for people of color and for women and all of those folks that, are, that were disproportionately um, disconnected before, COVID-19 has made that even worse. And so now we have to deal with not only uh, systemic and historical disconnection and disenfranchisement, now we also have to think about um, how this pandemic has impacted and make sure that we're doing things to, to um, compensate for all of these things top to bottom. So for forward cities, one of the ways we think about this is this idea of you can't change just one thing at a time. We want to make sure that we're not taking too granular approach. So we start at a high level and think about this as systems change work. Um, and systems change is really about this idea of understanding how things are interconnected. And that's the work of ecosystem building, is understanding how they're connected and how um, being able to see where there are levers you can pull to make change within the system. And, you know, Oscar described ecosystems as this idea of the equitable flow of, res I mean, the flow of resources um, from, and we see it, flow of resources from the people that have them to the people that need them. And what happens when you have an inequitable ecosystem is the flow is blocked. Um, imagine, you know, you have a stream and someone puts up a dam. They, they do that for some positive purposes, but in, in a situation where we're trying to get resources from one place to another, if you block that off, then you've got, you've created barriers for people that you need to uh, create intentional ways to remove. And so our systems work leads into this idea of entrepreneurs, um, uh, primarily, you know, what do they need? Uh, market opportunities and, and capital, we know this. Um, we, uh, the other part, major part of the ecosystem is the equippers, the people who have the resources and the information and knowledge to share. And this 
layer of the ecosystem level work is about connecting those two things and remo removing the barriers between them. And we do that at Forward Cities um, through some, some very key ways. Um, we think about this idea of, uh, of uh, developing solutions for communities based on where they are. And so if you were uh, uh, in your community, your needs may differ depending on where you are at your stage of your ecosystem development or where, who is uh, sort of taking a lead role in the work and where you are in this point in time as well. And so Forward Cities has developed a series of, solu of community solutions um, one is to help communities understand this, this idea of abide and leaning into um, really a training of cultural competence and anti-racism um, in this particular time. We have programs that lean into how can we jumpstart governments um, into really dealing with this where they sit right now and the need to, um, to find more equitable ways to spend um, stimulus funds. Uh, we have solutions for regions. How can you make sure that there's an equitable flow of resources between communities in a particular region and that they are each, each community in that region is finding a role uh, that fits well into the whole. Uh, we also know that navigation for entrepreneurs is a challenge right now. Finding uh, resources, knowing where to go, knowing where to go first and then next. Um, this idea of digital and human navigators is really important. And so we lean into helping communities to understand that, particularly in this time. And then there's some communities that want to do a deep dive. Uh, they, they really need, um, you may have, uh, you know, really want to understand from uh, beginning to end who your ecosystem is. And so we help, uh, help you assess uh, where you are and where you stand and what resources you have, gaps, challenges, and opportunities. And then we help you co-create solutions to uh, lean into and address those. And then um, on the back end, we help you understand uh, not only how to measure impact long-term, but also how to tell those stories, how to get the word out and create a, a broad buy-in uh, for the ecosystem, and then how to continue learning along the way. And then this, this year, we're particularly excited about leaning into something um, pretty awesome, which we believe is, is, is time has come. And that is when you, we're a time when we can't be race and gender agnostic. Um, there's, there needs to be solutions that are specifically compensatory for black communities in America because of the deep uh, rooted history of systemic racism. And so we've developed a solution for, for communities uh, that's focused on how can we reimagine black Wall Street um, in our country and go back to a time when black businesses uh, were the, the root of black culture and community uh, and, and how can we rebuild um, those, those particular systems in a place-based way, particularly working with black-centric cohorts, co-working spaces and accelerators. So excited as we, as Forward Cities begins to lean into this work, we hope that you are also um, thinking about these things in your community and having these conversations about uh, how does your community specifically uh, lean into issues, these issues that are facing all of us um, that we all want to find solutions to. So we're grateful to be here today. I'll turn it over uh, to Garrett to talk about how we measured this work. Thanks, Faye. And uh, thanks again to Oscar, uh, Star Commons, and, and everyone for joining us um, today. And so when we talk about measuring the health and equity of the ecosystem, uh, right, that's a big question. Um, it can be difficult enough to measure what's visible, right? The infrastructure that exists, the programs that exist, and the allocation of revenues. Um, and so, so then to go beyond that and talk about then how do we go about measuring health and equity ecosystem through those things that are not as visible, not as measurable. And that's something we really try to do is to, to try to understand uh, the deeper fabric that exists when it comes to trust, connectivity within the ecosystem, the awareness of resources of one, or of one another, the culture that exists and the efficacy uh, of the programs that exist as well. Um, and one thing I, I, I also want to name is that, that when we talk about measurement, measurement could be an objective or a sub subjective process, right? You can have someone come in and actually check off whether certain things exist and actually look for them. Um, but we take a, an intentionally subjective approach in our measurement because we re really want to understand the perceptions, the feelings, the awareness of support within an ecosystem. So 
when we think about measurement, ideally we want to guide communities through this process. The first one being is gaining some collective understanding of the community's entrepreneurial environment. Uh, sometimes there's often a misalignment, but having folks come together and uh, build that collective knowledge is an important exercise. The second thing is to then, once you have folks together talking, getting some common understanding of their perception of the ecosystem, uh, emerging that some challenges or opportunities for growth that may exist. And then with that, three, we'd like to then push community members to then align and actually leverage their assets so much of the time it could, the focus could be spent on the gaps or the challenges that exist. But our hope is by bringing folks together and creating some alignment, they could actually acknowledge the assets that they have in the ecosystem and then link them together to address those challenges. And lastly, when you have folks in the ecosystem beginning to have these, these structure, foundation, structured foundational conversations, uh, you can use it as an opportunity to pull more collaborators in uh, within the network and take and magnify the impact of the work. So with that, I would love to actually introduce you to the E3 scorecard or the tool that we use uh, to facilitate this conversation with communities. Again, E3 stands for equity for every entrepreneur. And within this, we have four key buckets, uh, really essential parts to a healthy ecosystem. The first being people. And within people, we have two areas of focus. Uh, but before moving into those, I think it's, it's important to acknowledge that people really serve as the, the heart and the, the most valuable resource within the ecosystem. Uh, it's where it starts and it's what everything builds off from. And so within people, we have these two categories that we like to, to reflect upon. Uh, first being talent pipeline and mentors. These are to actually lead staff and support emerging and existing businesses champions and ecosystem builders who serve as the trusted connectors and navigators within the ecosystem. After people, we have the programs. This is what actually empowers the people, the entrepreneurs, the ecosystem, ecosystem builders and other ecosystem stakeholders to do the work. Within programs, we have on ramps and pathways for entrepreneurs and businesses to launch, grow and or scale their business intersections and conversations that actually facilitate the dynamic interaction of people, ideas, and resources in the ecosystem. Our third area of focus or third theme is networks. This is the infrastructure, what connects and empowers the programs and people to be realized in an ecosystem. Within that, we have capital and funding for the growth of the local entrepreneurs and businesses in all sectors and at all stages. And we have policy and supports that ensure infrastructure and funding for equitable businesses and ecosystem sustainability. And lastly, our fourth theme within our E3 scorecard is narratives. This is what propels the work forward so that the work that gets done doesn't get lost. Within narratives, we have identity and storytelling of the ecosystem's authentic story in a way that highlights both its personality and its diversity. We also have metrics and learnings that track the health and the maturity of the ecosystem over time. And before I move on, I, I wanna acknowledge that, it, that these all play together, all these, these thematic areas, and they empower each other, they are reliant upon each other, um, and all of them must be considered uh, when evaluating the health of an ecosystem. I also wanna name that each one of these thematic areas uh, over time, there were structures and systems their intention designed to exclude particular persons from an ecosystem. And we kind of dive into these thematic areas, these categories and subcategories as we call them in an effort to be really intentional about, about saying that, okay, exclusionary practices were intentionally built. So then what does it look like to reflect upon them and build the actual structure, the programs that our communities deserve? So diving into the actual, uh, what does this actually look like, uh, the E3 scorecard? Um, so the E3 scorecard takes the form of, of a survey where ecosystem stakeholders rate the extent to which they uh, agree that a certain aspect is a healthy component of the ecosystem. So I wanna showcase just within our category of programs, and you may recall we have two subcategories with, within programs, on ramps and pathways and intersections and conversations. This is an example of what it may look like. There's a series of 
pretty detailed elements, we call them, or, or, or particular areas to reflect upon within an ecosystem uh, where folks can, can scan through them. And again, uh, while it may look like it here, it's not a checklist. They're actually, each individual takes it in isolation so that they can provide their perception, their perspective on the ecosystem and, and rate the extent to which each particular aspect, each element is a healthy component of it. All those scores then roll up together uh, into uh, to get a picture of what ecosystem stakeholders believe in. Uh, and they roll up into an, an actual report that the goal of this report is it's not benchmarked to any other community. It's a reflection of what individuals within a particular community or region, whatever it may be, believe about their community. It's also not meant to be evaluative, but rather a tool that can be used to build a common vision in identifying strengths and gaps within an ecosystem. And this is what the process actually looks like. Uh, so as I described, folks come together uh, and there's an engagement. Before they come together, there's engagement. Uh, uh, we're engaged in collecting input. So this is the actual survey that gets administered to each individual. And when we talk about who receives uh, the survey, uh, ideally, uh, when we talk about ecosystem stakeholders, uh, we're thinking about ecosystem builders, uh, representatives of entrepreneur support organizations, uh, entrepreneurs, policymakers, academics who, who touch the entrepreneur ecosystem space. So inputs collected from all these stakeholders at different levels and from different perspectives. On our end, we analyze the data and we produce a report. And the goal of this report, again, is to, is to be almost like a guiding document uh, that actually represents the opinions expressed by the community. And lastly, we convene the community members, everyone who has a, has a stake in that ecosystem, who provided input to actually engage in dialogue, to understand what the E3 scorecard is, what the results look like for their community, and then what does it look like to actually use these results to identify potential pilot projects or infrastructure building projects, or we can continue this work. So I think I, I, I I'd be upset to not name that, like, there are sometimes issues in, in, in this process. And because sometimes we focus on the, the inequities and in the outcomes, right? But sometimes it's just as important to focus on inequities in the process. And we run into sometimes some challenges and challenges that, that we try to purposefully address uh, when we talk about assisting community measuring the health of its ecosystem. That first one is this perception of a process being evaluative. Uh, and, and we try to really solve that by positioning the E3 scorecard as a formative experience led by ecosystem stakeholders. So many aspects of this work are evaluative, um, where everything's contingent upon getting more funding. Uh, so it's really important to carve out a space, a safe space in which individuals can provide their candid perception or, or, or sense of health when it comes to the ecosystem. A second challenge can be lack of buy-in from those with institutional power. And they sometimes may be able to block this work from, from happening or actually getting the momentum it needs. That's why we see that sometimes when this is at play, I mean, other times in the ecosystem, you have those with institutional power who are invested in reflecting on the, the, the sense of equity within an, an ecosystem. But in those environments where they aren't so fortunate to have that institutional player who believes in that approach, um, it's really important to engage those invested in centering equity. Um, while we're reflecting on the facets of an entrepreneurial ecosystem. Because sometimes what happens then is you gain, you gain that type of momentum from maybe small players in the ecosystem. And once that momentum uh, is carried forward, then you get the institutional players uh, who, are, who are pushed to address it as well. Third challenge is some, there's this belief that data collection does not benefit those who provide the data. Time and time again, we see that data can be extractive of a community. It could take information without giving anything in return or without getting, giving anything with legs that's substantive enough to be carried forward. So it's really important when doing this work to define, define the objective of data collection from the outset, identify the future outputs and also opportunities to engage folks. If individuals are going to provide their data, they must know how these data are gonna be used and how they will be continually looped into the process to inform the work that gets carried forward. And so with that, what does it look like for work to be carried forward? Um, I'd love to introduce our, our Senior Director of Learning Networks, Brett Breton, to provide a little insight. 
Thanks, Garrett. Um, so you all have had a chance to deep dive now. Uh, the 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 purposing of this scorecard, what it is that's trying to be gathered, and how you can use it, how you can utilize it um, to your benefit. So I want to give a particular focus on one element uh, of 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 the eight that you just had introduced um, that I think is the most important. I mean, you know, as Garrett said, these work in in harmony and unison with each other, and there's a state of balance that comes with um, all the elements of an ecosystem to 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 be highly functioning. It's definitely a uh, some of the parts type approach. Um, but the champions and ecosystem builders are such an essential role. They serve as really the connective tissue of the ecosystem in, in the realest possible way. Um, so it's really important that this group is in a lot of ways representative of the greater capture of entrepreneurs on the whole. And by that, I mean, they need to represent um, beyond demography, they need to represent the views of different industry sectors, um, obviously different racial groups, gender, um, even socioeconomic groups, so that there's a broad balance in the voices that you're, you're hearing and, and that get amplified uh, when trying to determine uh, the strength of an ecosystem. What we have found is that all too often there is kind of a, um, a quiet and, and really unknown um, suffering that happens in an ecosystem. And it's very hard to ascertain. It was really the motivation behind creating the C3 scorecard in the first place. Um, so, you know, your, your ability to be connected to other champions and ecosystem builders is going to be essential. And it really becomes incumbent upon the ecosystem on the whole, but especially these, these specific um, folks who might not even identify as an ecosystem builder, maybe they do, um, but in many cases they don't and they're just doing the work of an ecosystem builder, um, to come to know each other and almost have a network within the network um, so that there can be a less formal acknowledgement of where the ecosystem is serving entrepreneurs um, across a given region or community and where it's not. Um, so, you know, when we look at how this plays out in example, we we saw the importance of ecosystem building, um, you know, early on in some of our cities as, as really, really having some deficiencies in key areas. And in the case of Pittsburgh, um, the council there really identified um, the need to shore up kind of the connectivity between an entrepreneurial support organization and the entrepreneur um, with a program that could activate some of these um, ecosystem builders and champions in a more dynamic way. Uh, this is where our Navigator program was born uh, in 20, uh, early 2019. Uh, it went into action in late 2019 and, and is still running today. In fact, it's become so formalized now that it is embedded in one of the anchor uh, entrepreneurial nonprofits that serves the city of Pittsburgh and, and beyond. Um, we learned a great deal from this. Uh, over the, over you know, the three dozen communities that we've worked on, but, but especially the the dozen that we've worked with more recently, um, we saw navigator needs really emerge in, in each of these cities so that it got to a point where um, we could apply some of the best practices that came from what we did in Pittsburgh um, to all of our other cities. So the concept of a navigator is pretty simple. First off, it's somebody, uh, again, if you think about what I just talked about, the dynamics of uh, having ecosystem builders that represent all of the entrepreneurs in, in, a, in a community, Having those people then uh, have an understanding of who are the entrepreneurial support organizations that are delivering specific resources, what's their cultural competence level, how, how able are they to, to, to go beyond maybe a static kind of, um, you know, uh, singular majority um, uh, group of entrepreneurs and really, really serve the mass. Of, of entrepreneurs that, that are, are aspiring to do more. Um, and then they, again, create kind of that, that network within a network um, so that they can understand who's being served, who's, who's doing better work uh, across the region in terms of the ESOs, um, and then obviously advise and, and make connections for, for entrepreneurs more, more appropriately. Um, when we look at it in cities in America, and I'm sure cities globally in many ways, um, you know, we think about a city, but there's so many sub-communities to a city. 
that have their own life to them. Pittsburgh is a classic example of this. And so it served as a good sandbox for us to learn in. Um, so what happens uh, in, in Hilltop, for example, is gonna be very different than what happens um, in, in a completely different part of the city, but that's only three or four miles away. Um, so we had to take a very, very um, calculated approach in terms of who these navigators were that we were recruiting, that we were putting in, uh, you know, su supporting financially to be able to do this work. Um, we had to take a very calculated approach about who they knew in the, in the ESO landscape, what entrepreneurs they would be able to serve so that we could make sure that there was good balance across um, the total approach. Um, I'm starting to see the navigator approach as being something that's going to be a staple of uh, ecosystem work from here on out. We've seen in uh, the states that um, it has gotten federal attention. There's a $100 million rollout of a community navigator program now, uh, which is aimed to do just this. Um, and so I think we're going to see more people recognize, A, that maybe they've already been doing this informally, and, and there is a more formal path for them to do it, and, and B, that cities and, and counties uh, or regions start to recognize the importance of, of this role and uh, start committing um, you know, funding to, to support it uh, for, pos for posterity. So um, we wanted to do that because we, want to see, we wanted you to see really close in what one of these elements look like. Uh, we realized this was a quick presentation of the information. And most importantly to us, we want to open up some Q&A. But um, the three of us uh, are, are actively working on this every day in cities across the country and uh, you know, are very open to, to outreach and to um, providing support where uh, your specific needs arise. Um, so here's some information about our website and how you can follow up specifically with Garrett and I um, if you have more questions about the scorecard or some of the programs that we have run. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Brett. Thanks a lot, Garrett. Thanks a lot, Faye, for the great presentation. A lot to a lot to, to digest. I mean, it's really great content and really great approach that we, we have seen today in this webinar. Um, and while we leave some, some time uh, for people to, to digest a little bit and to think about specific questions for you, I also have some, some from my side. Uh, you know that um, we, we consider ourselves as more as like uh, uh, from 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 this topic perspective, like digital barrier removers, <laughs> so we try to to remove barriers from from digital perspective. I'm I'm really interested about uh, how you are looking at digital uh, for your services and for your strategies. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to jump in there to start. So. Um... We take the same approach, a barrier identification approach. And that was really, that predecessed the E3 scorecard in a number of ways. When we first started doing work in, in kind of the, the, the present day version of Forward Cities um, that was built off of the, the seven years of work that we've, we've done so far, um, it was very centered on um, barrier identification, um, uh, making sure that we had diverse voices to develop, to, to understand what the barriers were and to also develop strategies, a, a human-centered design approach to that. Um, so any of the, for example, the Navigator program is a great example. Um, it, it, was, it was derived from hearing from entrepreneurs on the ground who are saying, listen, I, you're telling me these resources exist, but I don't even know how to get started. And, or as an alternative, you know, I've gone in to, you know, talk to some of the folks at these ESOs, but they don't understand my path. They don't understand my background. And so um, barrier identification is kind of one of the first things that we do. I think what the shift has happened over time with Forward Cities, though, is we've tried to get much more generative. So we want to understand the barriers. We want data to inform them. We want, um, aside from qualitative, we want, uh, aside from quantitative, we want qualitative understandings as well. But um, we're taking a more generative approach now. So um, you know, when we bring people together, including the entrepreneurs that face these barriers, how can how can we think about a future that would be absent of these barriers, that would would uh, serve the, the the community of entrepreneurs in ways that it's not currently serving them? And and that's a that's a very it's been a subtle but very interesting pivot for us. It's just where you place your focus. Um, it's a more progressive mindset uh, that we apply a growth mindset, um, but it still has to at the end. Of, at the end of the day, be informed at the base level by the barriers that, that entrepreneurs are facing. 
Yeah, right. Um, um, yeah, so since I think that we are also collecting now some some cues, some questions. So Alex is asking, uh, Alex from the Canon in Houston. So curious how cities have taken the E3 scorecard and implemented it effectively, particularly differentiating between what was consciously created versus what emerged from the efforts. Yeah, thanks. Uh, that's a great question, Alex. Uh, I, I'll actually, I'm going to tee this up as a tag team between myself and Brett. Um, uh, and we'll lean into actually uh, our work in central New Mexico and our eShip communities. And so uh, we had we had uh, a group of folks take the E3 scorecard and have go have some deep dive conversations um, across a, a council of, of people who are, who are leaning into this work um, as a part of our eShip communities engagement. And one of the things that that uh, stood out in their scoring was that they all agreed that there was some gaps in program in in their in the programs piece. They wanted there were there were um, farmers and growers in their area being left out of um, uh, the ability to be able to equitably participate in the supply food supply chain. Uh, and so they wanted to figure out and start to chew on. Okay, well, how do we address that? How can we, as a small group of people, um, make any change in something that big? Uh, and I'll turn it over to Brett to emerge what they then did, um, how they came together, and what they were able to create as a result of having that understanding. Yeah, and just to give a little more background, you know, this is this is an engagement that had been running for just shy of a year by the time they finally got to the scorecard. Um, they had done some pretty interesting things, but I think I bring this up because you see the, how dynamic the change was once they had the E3 scorecard informing their understanding. Um, so there's something in America called Good uh, Agricultural Practices Gap, and it's US, part of the USDA. They recognize uh, growers who you know, do a um, laundry list of items to make sure that food safety um, and food quality are, are, are being prioritized as they grow. Um, and it's hard for a lot of growers who don't have GAP certification to get access to larger procurement opportunities like senior centers and schools. And so um, in the case of, of this group in New Mexico, again, which was very heavily grower informed, um, these are either growers themselves or people who work with growers every day, um, they decided that it would be great if we set up food hubs across the state that could tap into diverse groups. Now think, you know, Think in the navigator approach once again, like, but from an agricultural point of view, they could tap into diverse groups, some indigenous, um, uh, heavy Latinx, and then even some, you know, larger urban farmers, urban in New Mexico is Santa Fe and Albuquerque, um, to, to create food hubs that would have kind of a sense of a community of practice and that would go through the gap certification process together so that they could then um, very intuitively and very in a very connected manner. Um, reach that level, that status, and then as a whole, the council works on ways to get them into some of these uh, procurement opportunities that escape them. Uh, it's very interesting in New Mexico, 90% of the food they produce leaves the state and 90% of what they eat comes from other states. So it, it, this should not be that way. Like we should be able to, if there's a farm within a mile of a school, we should be able to get some of those, uh, those products into the, into the hands of uh, uh, children that are gonna consume them every day. Uh, so this is a way to try to accomplish that goal. And again, without the E3 scorecard, I'm not sure that we could have at least as easily gotten to that point, that understanding. Yeah. Yeah, we are getting more and more questions. So uh, Ty Vispa said that when you use E3 scorecards to measure how rich the ecosystem is, do you also provide them the practical solution to leverage them from the current status to the next level? That's a great question. Um, and and I think the way that this work has been done and entre entrepreneurial support has been done in the past, that answer uh, would have been a positive yes, would have been yes. They We gave them the tool to figure out what they needed and then we told them the solution and then they implemented the solution. And that's actually not the way Forward Cities believes that uh, we should work in community. And so we, uh, our approach is very much community centric and community led. And so we actually share back this data, um, the results, and we use it to, to as Brett said, to, I mean, as Garrett said, to start conversations. And then we facilitate these leaders to co-design solutions together. 
And so, yes, we will share with them, hey, here's what has worked in other communities as best practices. But in the end, this is their community. Only they uniquely know what their community needs, what their community can hold, and what will resonate with their entrepreneurs and, and other service providers. And so we create a space for sense making and co-creation, and we facilitate a process to develop solutions and give them the tools to measure the impact of that work. Yeah, and I would say that facilitating this kind of, of conversations and, and, and places uh, for, for the different actors is, is something that uh, is very important. So we, we have seen many times when trying to, to bring this more understanding or more holistic understanding about how an ecosystem should be developed that oftentimes, mm -hmm. though the different actors that are part of the ecosystem didn't meet earlier together. <laughs> so it's important to open those channels to basically to, to start aligning thoughts and aligning visions and, and ideas and, and put them all work together towards the same and common vision, right? Most definitely, particularly because you want them to grow muscles to do this on their own, right? We Forward Cities doesn't need to be there for forever. So if we facilitate and model how they can do this process, then when we're not there, they're able to continue and sustain the work on their own. I, I'm also curious because uh, one of the, uh, you know that in order to create this kind of uh, equal ecosystem that has to represent different interests, different uh, genders, race, uh, uh, verticals, industries, whatever. So it's, it's important uh, in order to serve all of them equally, it's important to become neutral. Uh, and and wondering if, if you have some kind of, uh, or implementing any kind of tools or strategies to basically to, to start at least communicating that all the actions that you are planning to do is equally for everyone. Hmm. So, so I, I think that that's a, that tends to be a, a, a set of work that emerges later on in, in our engagements. Um, it's what we find is that if you can get a small group of people working on a problem together, uh, and creating something that others see, then it starts to get awareness and traction. You start to build a sense that, hey, there's something going on over there. Uh, and then other people want to be a part of it. Uh, if they see energy, they follow the energy. And, and often the way we share about those stories through our story, uh, or those uh, uh, actions and the emerging pro programs is uh, you know, through our marketing and storytelling. And so if we're able to then um, reach people with these messages and, and uh, connect the dots, help people connect the dots between how they can get connected to the work, that's where this really gets special, is when you begin to see the university uh, folks be able to say, hey, we'd love to get our students involved in, you know, in uh, this work. And how do we connect to that program? Uh, when you have folks, you know, uh, from... Uh, you know, corporations saying, hey, you know what, there's something that that we that feels right for us. So we would love to support this through sponsorship. Um, when you have entrepreneurs who, who are able to say, I was positively impacted by this, this, this effort. Um, I think that that's, that's the ultimate, um, you know, sort of signal that something is working. Yeah, I agree. Uh, we, we, we still have questions. So Carlos is asking about, uh, about the role that Anchor institutions should play in supporting inclusive entrepreneurship ecosystem. So where is working best and how to engage these institutions in an intentional way? Uh, Brett, you want to take that one? On was that Anchor institutions? Yeah, okay. So... Um... You know, Faye started to just allude to this. When you when you go into any city, you're going to get um, a combination of anchor institutions, um, and obviously, it's a term that gets defined very differently. Um, you can see hospital systems be a part of that. You can see, uh, obviously, corporate anchors, um, and in philanthropy, we would count in that in that category as well. In many ways, um, they admit, they are the ones who have been influencing. I'll say. Uh, the status quo for whatever it is in a particular city or region uh, up to this day. So what's important is that we, we come to understand how the role that they've played. And we also come to understand their willingness to, to evolve. 
uh, because we are in many ways, it's the status quo that has created the situation that we have for black and brown entrepreneurs in, in American cities. Um, and so some of the practices that have been applied have to be undone to some sense. So there has to be kind of a willingness uh, on the part of anchor institutions. We have come across many anchor institutions who have shown that willingness and have been major, um, because of that willingness, have, have accelerated um, the pace at which an ecosystem can evolve to meet all the people that it, it, it attempts to serve. We have also come across some anchor institutions have, that have been resistant to that change. Um, and it has become very difficult then to have any sense of consensus around even what to do, let alone the impact you can have. You have to remember that at the end of the day, it's really about an authentic winning of the mind and the heart of the entrepreneur, um, the under-resourced, under-connected entrepreneur. If you can get that as an anchor institution, you can do tremendous things. Um, but that doesn't come, that you can't fake that. Um, we can't fake that as forward cities and you can't fake that as an anchor in a city that's been there for 10, 20, 100 years and has a reputation. So even if your reputation as an anchor is uh, one that has been in some way compromised, whether you acknowledge that or not, that's what you're hearing from community members that we're ultimately trying to affect. Uh, there has to be a recognition of that and then there has to be a willingness to change. And so um, are we, do we have some panacea to, to solve for, you know, to go into any city and, and sprinkle fairy dust and, 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 and shift some of these anchors and the perceptions they have? No, we don't. Um, I'd say we failed as often as we've succeeded in influencing, but we can be one small piece of the connectivity of voice of this entrepreneur on the ground, this underconnected, under-resourced entrepreneur um, to the ear of the anchor, um, to the ear of the treetop um, and, and help to ensure that at least there's a chance for them to be influenced by that and to change some of the habits that have created the status quo we're trying to in some ways overcome. And, and I'll add that I think there's a reason why knowledge sharing and storytelling is so important too, because those communities that have those anchor institutions that are key stakeholders facilitating this work, those stories should be shared and communities can pick up those stories um, and, and even put pressure on, on their local anchor institution uh, to, to create similar change in their community, to help with similar change in their community as well. All right, I think that we don't have more, more questions. Just one, one last question from my side. I'm always interested in, in what, what, what are the, the coming things that you are preparing? Uh, so anything in the pipeline that you are preparing for, for next year or at the end of this year? So what are your thoughts about that your roadmap plan look like? Most definitely. So a couple of things that we're, we're really heavily leaning into right now, and I, I touched on them a bit earlier. Um, one is this idea of, of this is we're in a time, an unprecedented time of uh, federal stimulus dollars. And so there is money flowing like never before to cities, states um, and regions around the country uh, in the U.S. Uh, related to, to uh, re recovery helping businesses recover from the pandemic. And so for us, we're really, really focused on how can we um, work with local uh, champions like, like you all um, in your communities across the US uh, to get in front of those government stakeholders and help them to understand how to, not only how to uh, spend these stimulus funds in, in an equitable way and compensatory way, but also how do they engage and get the people, the right people at the table to make those decisions. And so they've not sort of decided where the money's gonna go without the people who are, will be most impacted. Uh, and so we're leaning into that work. And then secondly, I'm really excited by this Black Wall, E3 Black Wall Street work. And um, if you look, uh, if you happen to catch the USA Today or uh, read USA Today, be on the lookout um, on the 30th. We, we've co-written an article about uh, the, the other Black Wall Streets, Durham, North Carolina, our headquarters city being one of them. And so we're this is a, a, a kickoff and part of a big set of work that we're leaning into um, that we like to think about as, as the curb cut effect. And while yes, uh, equity and inclusion are important for all in America, um, because of the history of slavery in this country, um, Black communities have been disproportionately impacted um, uh, on a significant level from an economic standpoint, right, that often doesn't get addressed. And entrepreneurship and business is one way to, um, to correct for that. 
um, and the equitable uh, and compensatory investment in, in Black businesses and Black business ecosystems, we believe is a part of what's going to make a difference uh, right now in America. Definitely. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Faye, for, for these final words. Anything that you want to add at the end of, of, the, of the session? Nothing. I just want to say thank you uh, to everybody who tuned in. Um, I'm sure the hours are all over the place for many of you. So some at night, some in the morning, um, and some midday. Uh, but we always appreciate the chance to tell the story of this work. Um, we know we're not alone in doing it. And so um, it will take, a, just like we talk about local ecosystems, it will take a, a national, even global ecosystem in order to properly influence economic development practices to be more inclusive of entrepreneurship as a a legitimate path and so uh keep fight, fighting the good fight you are not doing it alone and uh you know sometimes i need to realize that and it's good to see people show up and and, and hear that message um so we thank you for all you do and for showing up today well said brett <laughs> thanks so, thanks so much for for the invitation and coming here i mean it was really great to know what you are doing there uh, in in the us to support equality and inclusiveness and and and, and so forth so let's conclude here. It was a great time that we spent today today with with the with the forward cities guys, and and we are preparing more uh, webinars for next month. So let's be in touch, and thank you, everyone. Most definitely. And I, uh, one last thing, Oscar, uh, I will say, share with everyone. We may not have mentioned this, uh, but the scorecard is a is a free uh, tool for anyone to use. And so um, if you go to our website, you can access it, and we'll. we'll uh, fill out the form and we'll get you started on that process. And we will make sure that that we are distributing that resource for everyone after the, the webinar together with the recording and the materials. Excellent. Thanks Excellent. all. Great to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Oscar. Thank you, Brett. Thank you, Barrett. Thank you, Faye.